chronic condition of hyperglycemia, which has devastating effects on people's lives, is, is common and affects something like 400 million people around the world. Now, 80% of those people live in low and middle income countries. The disease affects people of working age, uh, and in those countries, um, it is uh, it's very expensive to treat and it's very expensive to have because it impacts on, on, on income. So the condition is a problem uh, of low and middle income countries that's increasing in frequency and is a clinical problem. But because it impacts uh, on such large populations, it's a public health problem. But because it's affecting disadvantaged populations and is impacting on their economies is actually a challenge to sustainable development. Now the question before us really is how can we respond to this challenge? Now the prevention of diabetes is possible. This is the most encouraging news from the last 20 years. And that news comes from randomized controlled trials undertaken initially in the United States of America and in Finland, and then in various other populations around the world. And it was possible to demonstrate that if you found people with pre-diabetes, a condition of raised glucose levels, but without formal diabetes, that it was possible by individual level intervention in those people to reduce progression to diabetes. And in all those trials, a combination of diet, weight loss, and physical activity intervention gave rise to an approximate halving of the risk of progression to diabetes. And certainly in the Finnish study, it was a combination of five behavioral targets. Achievement of a normal level of obesity or body mass index, having regular physical activity, eating a diet that was low in total fat, a diet that was low in saturated fat, and a diet that was high in fiber. And if people achieved four or five of those behavioral targets, the risk of progression to diabetes was in the Finnish study was zero. But if people were achieving none of those targets, it was about 40% over three years. So we know that individual level intervention can reduce progression to diabetes over the short term. Now in follow-up studies in Finland and also in China, it was clear that that effect is long-term and lasted beyond the duration of that individual level intervention. The studies in China also demonstrated not, that not only was that lifestyle intervention associated with a reduction of risk of progression to diabetes, but also with evidence of reduction of risk of the complications of diabetes, specifically retinopathy, the eye disease associated with diabetes, and importantly demonstrating that it was associated with a reduction of cardiovascular mortality. Now that has been demonstrated in the Chinese study in Da Qing, in women only, for some reason, and not in men, but further studies will investigate whether it's an effect that's seen in both. But the important fact is that the long-term benefits of these lifestyle changes uh, persist and that they give rise to changes in real hard clinical outcomes. Not only that, but cost effectiveness analysis has demonstrated that the costs of intervening are relatively small in, in comparison to the benefits, and that these sorts of interventions are affordable for many healthcare settings. The challenge is whether they are the only approach. Is that a sufficient uh, a way of dealing with the condition? Many countries around the world are contemplating uh, changes to their healthcare systems to implement primary prevention uh, in, uh, strategies of this type, but is that enough? And I think the, the uh, general consensus is th that it's not. And these individual approaches to prevention, important and evidence-based though they are, need to be complemented by a different approach. And that different approach takes a step back and asks the question, are these changes that we see in populations in the way we lead our lives, in diet, physical activity, are they the result of individual problems? Or are we really creatures who live in a society where we make individual choices, but those individual choices are bounded by the type of environment we live in? We might think that we have complete control 
on our physical activity levels. But if we live in a place where stairs are not readily accessible or it's difficult for a go to walk, for, go for a walk at lunchtime, or if we're uh, constrained to our cars, then our physical activity is somewhat beyond our control. So I think in conjunction with thinking about diabetes as a clinical problem and thinking about its prevention as being an individual issue, we have to understand the science of what is driving physical activity and diet change in populations and then try and intervene at that level. So that needs a mix of science and also uh, political will. We have to accept that this condition is a public health problem, it's driven by societal level uh, changes in behavior. And we have to accept that we may need to intervene at the societal level uh, to change things. And in the case of physical activity, that may mean reconfiguring our built environment to make it possible for us to re-engineer physical activity into our lives, making it possible to have uh, healthy forms of transport and to be physically active in work as well as uh, recreation. And in the case of diet, we have to not just uh, impact on uh, people's uh, attitudes and wishes with respect to diet, but we have to affect the food supply, the price of food, to try and promote uh, healthy forms of eating. That may require some interventions that are uh, or have been uh, unpalatable to some forms of government, such as taxation of unhealthy foods or subsidy of healthy ones. But really, if we're to uh, tackle the problems of obesity and diabetes at the societal level, it requires that form of uh, radical thought coupled with uh, evidence of effectiveness. And I think it's only through the combination of uh, individual approaches to prevention coupled with these societal level changes that we're really going to uh, give hope to the some 600 million people around the world who are at risk of diabetes. Certainly in uh, developing countries where it's difficult to treat the people who have the condition now, the idea that we could swamp their healthcare system with people who need to be treated individually who have pre-diabetes, that's really unthinkable. And certainly in those situations, we need an evidence base that supports policy level interventions to uh, prevent diabetes. The problem of diabetes is not really one of unhealthy foods, but rather unhealthy diets. And the, the principal uh, driver of the rise in diabetes is the availability of, of calories, and particularly empty calories that uh, can be consumed which have no nutritional value. And this is a function of the food availability and the food supply coupled with the pricing of food. Of course, at one level, uh, the availability of cheap uh, and abundant calories is a massive public health advantage because it's uh, tended to reduce the prevalence of undernutrition. But really, the pendulum has slung far too far the, the, in the, the other way. And throughout the, the second half of the 20th century, the availability of cheap and abundant calories has given rise to an increasing prevalence of obesity and a consequent risk of diabetes. Now beyond that, there are some specific uh, food groups and diets that are associated with type 2 diabetes risk. First and foremost, they, one would look at processed meat and particularly red meat consumption, which is going, going up very steeply around the world. And that is so strongly associated with type 2 diabetes risk. On the flip side, people who eat diets that are rich in fresh fruit and vegetables seem to be protected from diabetes. Overall, people who eat a Mediterranean form of diabetes have a lower risk. Uh, and it suggests that um, a diet which is relatively rich in complex carbohydrates has high plant and vegetable uh, consumption, low red meat consumption, a moderate amount of alcohol, a sort of Mediterranean pattern may be the one that's uh, most beneficial to diabetes. So the best evidence we have about the, how our genetic predisposition to obesity and diabetes and uh, lifestyle uh, factors, how they interact and interplay to give rise to diabetes comes from large prospective cohort studies in which 
the risk factors have been assessed at baseline, and then people have been followed up for, uh, for the occurrence of diabetes subsequently. So here in Cambridge, I led uh, an international study called Interact from a population study of half a million people recruited across 10 different European countries in the EPIC study. And those people had their uh, diets and physical activity characterized at baseline and then were followed up. And uh, 12,403 of those people developed type 2 diabetes. And we were then able to study the combination of their genetic predisposition to diabetes with other factors such as obesity. Now, although genetic predisposition gives rise to an increase in diabetes risk, it is dwarfed by the impact of obesity. So amongst the individuals who were obese, yes, there was uh, uh, an increased risk in those who were obese and also were genetically predisposed to diabetes, but the risk of developing diabetes was high in all the individuals who were obese. Conversely, amongst um, people who were thin uh, or normal weight, there was a, a small increased risk in, in diabetes that was attributable to genetic predisposition, but it was uh, insignificant on, a, on an absolute scale. So these uh, data suggest that whilst uh, genetics is important in predisposing one to the condition, uh, the risk is really dominated very strongly by obesity and the drivers of obesity, diet and physical activity.